We are in the session nursing home costs and today doing our presentation is Jack Alpern. He is the founder and shareholder in the Alpern Law Firm located in Warren. Thank you for traveling today. Um, and he concentrates in advanced estate planning. So I'd like you to welcome Jack. To PBS 45 and 49 and SUMA Healthcare for inviting me to speak this morning. This topic is or should be of vital interest to everyone because all of us face the possibility, if not the probability, of spending some time in either assisted living or skilled nursing care during our lifetimes. Age doesn't matter. When my mother was confined to a nursing facility up in Aurora where I live, it uh, was startling to find that the patient across the hall was 19 years of age, going nowhere because of a serious brain injury. The question that we all face or will face is, how do we pay for this? How do we sustain any of the assets that our parents or we have accumulated and still pay our own way. That's the topic this morning. My law firm, the Alpern Law Firm, offers legal services throughout Northeast Ohio. Uh, we also offer elder care planning. Uh, we have as co-counsel to our law firm, attorney Lori Steiner from Cleveland, who will engage in the Medicaid planning area, uh, some of which we'll be talking about today. A little bit about me. I'm a native of East Liverpool, Ohio, received my bachelor's and law degree at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. I live in Aurora. I have two children, my daughter Julie, who happens to be here today, and my son David, who lives in California. I took postgraduate courses in the field of estate planning, basic and advanced, at Case Western University College of Law in Cleveland. I do a good deal of teaching throughout the area. This summer I'll be teaching at Chautauqua Institution uh, a course called The Inheritance We Leave to Our Heirs, A Blessing or a Curse? And the answer is yes. <laughs> it could be some of each. The question this morning that we face, though, is will there be an inheritance at all left? Uh, we have an internet website that gets a lot of traffic these days, www.alpernlaw.com. Uh, it is updated on a weekly basis, uh, a wealth of information available to you in the estate planning and elder law planning area. We have a newsletter that's posted there. We also have links to a lot of other sites that I think you will find very helpful. We always have an agenda when we have a meeting. This is no exception. So one of the things that we'll be talking about today is why we all need to plan for this day. We'll be looking at what I call the big picture, which is really beyond nursing home care to really the next generation. We're also going to talk about this as the biggest threat to leaving an inheritance of any kind to our children or grandchildren, this being the cost of nursing care. Uh, I'm going to go into a very general discussion in the area of the rules of Medicaid in Ohio, uh, the options that are now available to us, which are few in number. And then we're going to talk about some new planning strategies which have developed. And let me just say that the law with respect to Medicaid, the state distributed federal funding for those who cannot afford to pay for their own nursing care, is a very hot area in the law today. It is constantly changing. Each state's laws are, are different. Within the state of Ohio, you will find a difference in the way counties approach this and enforce the laws and regulations with regard to Medicaid, and even among caseworkers within the same county organization. There may be a difference in the way these rules and regulations are interpreted. So getting advice and getting guidance before you meet with Medicaid really becomes very critical. So the question is, who cares? Who should care about this area of our lives? And the answer is, 
Well, take a test. And this is a test that I have now with every single client with whom I meet in my estate planning practice. And that is, think about this for just a moment. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not important at all, 10 being as important as anything could be, how important is it to you that anything you own eventually will reach your children or grandchildren? If the answer to that question, to that quiz, is anything above a five, then you need to listen very carefully to our topic today. Because as I said a moment ago, the cost of paying for nursing care is today the single biggest threat to leaving anything to your heirs when you pass away. So the answer is everyone, everyone needs to be concerned about this very vital topic. You know, it's interesting, when families come to see me after a loved one has become institutionalized in a nursing home, or when they pass away, and things are a mess, or there's nothing left, or there's very little left to the family, people say to me, why would this happen? Why would our parents or our grandparents not take the time to plan for this time in life, which seems almost inevitable for all of us? And the answer is that people don't plan to fail. Unfortunately, they just fail to plan. And that's the problem. I know why. And you know why. And there's the biggest reason. A number of years ago when I was giving a presentation down in the Boardman area, I I put this slide up and there was an elderly gentleman seated in the back of the room who I know was hard of hearing because after I put this slide up, I heard him turn to the person next to him and say, procrastinate. I had that surgery and I couldn't sit down for months. (laughs) Well, he was a little puzzled. But the fact of the matter is that we all do this. If you look at my attic, you'd see a perfect example of this. The fact is that this is an area of life, planning for the bad things that can happen to people, that is one of the easiest to put off. And I could write another book about how many people have said to me, you know, Jack, you're right, I've got to get around to that, I've got to sit down, I've got to, you know the story. It doesn't get done. The second reason that most people don't take the time to plan besides procrastination is they are confused. That's why I'm here today, and I'm hopeful that at the end of this session, there will be less confusion and a great more knowledge in your minds about why this area of life really deserves our attention. Here is the fact. Our government, federal and particularly the state of Ohio, can no longer afford to pay for the nursing home costs of those who cannot afford to pay it. In this morning's Plain Dealer, there's an article that our governor is now wanting to add additional people, children, to the Medicaid rolls for certain needs that they may have. Very admirable goal. Who pays for that? The fact of the matter is that the average cost, average, in Northeast Ohio for nursing home care today, skilled nursing home care, is $6,300 a month. People find that staggering. Unless you are involved with a family that is paying this right now, you will find that astonishing over $75,000 a year per person. In other states, it is higher and lower. The average length of stay in a nursing home, and I've heard figures all over the place. This is a study that I most recently found. The average length of stay is over a year in a nursing home for anyone who is there. Obviously, many people for shorter periods of time and many people for longer periods of time. The number of persons covered by Medicaid in Ohio, not just for nursing home care, look at that, 170,000 adults. And it's the largest item or usually is the largest item in Ohio's budget, over $17 billion to be spent on Medicaid. The state of Ohio cannot afford to continue to do this. What's the result? The regulations to qualify for Medicaid eligibility become tighter. And I gave up trying to predict what the law does or will become in the future years ago. But on this one, I feel relatively certain. This is going to get worse. It's going to get harder and harder to qualify for Medicaid benefits. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. That is not an exaggeration. Many people used to come into my office and say, I'm concerned about the cost of estate taxes when I die. And I'm concerned about you know, the cost of probate and, and all of the expenses that will be attendant to the time when I pass away. Not anymore. This is or this should be the major concern. If I get sick, if I can't take care of myself, how in the world 
will my assets not out, how will my assets outlast me? And that's really the goal, to have something left, anything left for our families when we pass on. These are very general statements about the law pertaining to Medicaid. Please keep in mind there are lawyers that specialize or concentrate only in this area of the practice. This is a, an extremely complex area of the law, so what I'm giving you is a very general overview. First of all, you have to be medically in need of nursing home care in order to qualify. That usually is easily established by a doctor. Income eligibility. I don't have enough money. I'm taking in less than $6,300 on average per month, and I therefore cannot afford to pay for my own nursing home care. This, however, is the part that is most often misunderstood in the public, and that is what can I own and still qualify so that the state of Ohio will pay for my medical, medical bills and my nursing home costs, what can I own? And it's, this part is pretty straightforward. If you're a single individual, that's it, $1,500. Now, there are some exceptions, such as prepaid funeral costs, uh, an automobile that may be used to transport you for, for care. But in general, $1,500 is all you are allowed to own in order to qualify for Medicaid. If you are married, not less than $20,880 and not more than $104,400. Now, here's what that means. If you're a married couple, in general, the spouse who is healthy, the one who is not in a nursing home, can retain the family residence if it is in that person's name, and $104,400 of other assets, and that's it. Everything else will have to be spent in order to pay for nursing home care. So if you can't earn very much and you can't own very much in order to qualify for Medicaid, what are your options? Well, there's the first one. And I'm sorry to say that this is what most people do. They figure, I'm just not going to end up in a nursing home. Or, and this is the one I hear most often, not going to happen, Jack. Pillow over the head. One bullet in the chamber. I hear that all the time. My family knows my wishes. They won't let it happen to me. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kevorkian got out of prison just a couple of years ago after serving quite a term because he was attempting to help people pass away. That is still against the law and carries very serious criminal penalties in the state of Ohio. So doing nothing or assuming you'll just die and never end up in a nursing home may in fact not be an option. Would you mind holding your question until I get to the end? I promise you I won't leave here today before we get to it. Second option, in addition to doing nothing, purchase long-term care insurance. Every time I bring this up with families that I meet with, they say to me, that's really expensive, isn't it? It is, but so is $6,300 a month for nursing care. Long-term care insurance, like any insurance, depends upon several factors. One is, is it available to you? Is your health such that an insurance company will issue a policy on you? Unfortunately, in many cases, people find out that they have waited too long. Secondly, can I afford it? How will I pay two, three, four, five hundred dollars per month for this kind of coverage, and I may not use it? And that brings up the other fact. Procrastination gets in the way. People have said to me, you know, I'll think about it, someday I'll get to it, and then an illness sets in, and they are no longer eligible. The insurance is no longer available to them. Many people do not see the value. They say to me, what if I never use it? What if I just float away, and I never need the nursing home coverage. Well, one of the answers to that is we all have automobile insurance, or we better have it, and we may never use it. However, there are products on the market today that offer what's called a linked benefit. If you don't use the insurance to pay for your nursing home costs, there is a death benefit to your family. So, is there value in this kind of a product for your family? The only way you will ever know is to apply for it and find out first if it's available and then what will it cost. In some cases, people are turning to something called a reverse mortgage, which is a lien or an obligation against the home that creates the income stream to pay for long-term care insurance. So they're using the equity in their home 
to pay for the long-term care insurance, which is intended to keep them at home. And there are many people, frankly, like me, who have purchased long-term care insurance because they don't want to go to a nursing home. And there are policies that are available to pay for either in-home care or in-nursing home care. One of the things you want to be careful about, you want to very carefully investigate the financial strength of the company that is offering that policy. Ratings, financial ratings of insurance companies are regularly available. Make sure that you look into that before you consider purchasing a product. Here's the second option today. If you choose not to buy long-term care insurance, or even if you do, why can't you get yourself down to $1,500 by giving away your assets? The answer is you can. However, you need to be very careful. There are serious and drastic consequences to doing that, but it is still possible to do that even after the most recent change in Ohio law, which occurred on February the 8th of 2006. First, however, let's talk about what is a gift and what is not a gift. I'll ask a client, have you given anything away recently? No. And then the more we talk, well, I put my daughter's name on a bank account. I just gave a car to my son, just had his name put on the title. Ladies and gentlemen, those are gifts. Those are gifts when it comes to Medicaid. And this is where people need to be very careful. When you transfer control, putting someone else's name on a bank account where they can go in and withdraw the money anytime they want, that's a transfer of control, and that is a gift. Secondly, adding somebody's name to your home, your CD, your stocks, your bonds, your mutual funds. My apologies to the camera person. I know I bounce around a lot. I, if it sounds like I get passionate about this, it's because I am passionate about this. Adding a name to anything you own is a gift. So you've got to be very careful. By the way, there's another risk involved in adding someone else's name to anything you own. If the person whose name you add to anything you own gets into trouble, a lawsuit, bankruptcy, divorce, the asset that you put their name on could disappear, not because of your problem, but because of their problem. Guaranteeing a loan of another individual. Someone wants to buy a house, can't afford it, can't get the down payment, can't get financing. You agree to serve as a personal guarantor. You may have made a gift. If you are entitled to an inheritance and you say no thanks, that's a gift. That's called a disclaimer. It's a gift when it comes to Medicaid, not particularly when it comes to tax laws. So the question is, if all of those things are gifts, should we do them? Before you consider giving anything away, you need to be acquainted with the five-year look-back rule. And we're going to talk about this for a moment. Many people say, isn't it a fact that you can qualify for Medicaid if you gave something away more than three years ago? Well, now it's five. It probably will become longer than that. But the easiest way to explain this is to give an example. What you're about to see is a timeline. I want you to imagine a person has a total estate of $550,000. That includes their home, their cars, their investments, retirement plans, life insurance that has cash value. And assume that on May 1st of this year, they make a gift to their children or grandchildren or both of the better part of that, $300,000. One-time gift, all of it's gone. Well, first of all, when you give it away, it's gone. You've lost control of it. Now imagine that they have $250,000 left. So on May 1st, they've given away $300,000, <coughs> pardon me, of the $250,000 that constitutes everything they own. Now imagine that after that gift is made, it really doesn't matter when. Just imagine that after that gift is made, that individual is involved in an accident, a fall, automobile accident, whatever it may be, and they end up in a nursing home. Imagine now that they are doing what we call spend down. They're in a nursing home, and in the state of Ohio, for skilled nursing care, as a matter of fact, and assisted living, you pay your own way. So the government will say, you must use all of the income available to you except for a very small monthly amount. And then with, if that's not enough, and it usually isn't, you have to start spending down your assets. You have to start liquidating investments that you have. 
That's what spend down is. Now I want you to further imagine that that spend down continues until May the 3rd of 2013. So from the left side of that timeline to the right side of the timeline, five years and two days. All right? Now imagine after five years and two days, they're out of money. They're down to what the state of Ohio says a single individual can have, and that's $1,500. They apply for Medicaid. The family goes in and says, we're down to $1,500. We've spent all of the money other than that on nursing home care. Now we're asking the state of Ohio to take over and pay for our nursing home costs. The state of Ohio will say, fine, we'll do that. All you, the applicant, have to do is answer one question. Under oath, under penalty of perjury, within five years of the date you apply for Medicaid, did this person give away anything of value? And on that day, May 3rd of 2013, the answer is no. It's been more than five years by two days. And that's how critical the timing of all this is. If the answer is no, there were no gifts within the five-year period, then guess what? Medicaid will pay for their nursing care until they die. Medicaid pays. Now, for some people, not everyone, this is the perfect plan. I gave away a significant part of what I owned. What I left, what I kept, I have spent on my own nursing home care, and I'm down to $1,500. Medicaid will pay until I die. For some people, that's perfect because their kids have the $300,000. It's been more than five years since they gave it away. Medicaid is paying, and they're in a nursing home. Here is the problem. What happens if they made the gift on May 1st of 2008 of $300,000? They have $250,000 left. They spend down, but they run out of money before the five-year period ends. They're in a nursing home, they're out of money, and it's been less than five years since they made the gift. In goes the family member to Medicaid. We're down to $1,500. It's time for the state to pay. Same question, different answer. Did they make a gift within five years? Now the answer is yes. Watch what happens. The government will require in Ohio that we take the gift that was given away $300,000, and they will divide that by a number that they believe to be the average cost of nursing care throughout Ohio. In this case, $5,247. If you divide $5,247 into the amount of the gift, that means 57.18 months. Let's call it 58 months. And guess what? For 58 months, you don't get Medicaid. They don't go back after the $300,000 that you gave away. Oh, no. They just won't pay for your nursing home care. That's the law. And here's the part, as of February the 8th of 2006, that is even worse. The penalty period, the 58 months, does not begin to run when you made the gift. It begins to run when you're in a nursing home and you apply for Medicaid. So it's 58 months from that date that you see up there with the vertical line on the right-hand side when there won't be Medicaid. Now, imagine this situation. Director of the nursing home comes to see you in a bed and says, it's time to pay. You say, I'm down to $1,500. I don't have the money. And they say, well, we've applied for Medicaid and they've rejected it. You can't pay. Medicaid won't pay. If your children won't give the money back or can't because they've spent it, what will happen? Will you even be in a nursing home? That is an unanswered question right now. So there are risks to keeping things in your name, and there are risks to give them away, to giving them away. You are able to give them away to your children and to protect them against the children's problems, but you need to consult with a Medicaid planning attorney in order to determine exactly how that is done. Now, let's say that you spend time in a nursing home, you have some assets out there that have not been sold or used up. Medicaid has paid for a part of your care, or all of it, and you die. The state of Ohio, through the Medicaid Recovery Program, can now file a claim against your estate and collect what should have been paid from your estate before your heirs receive anything. 
So, what's the conclusion? You have to have a plan. If it involves long-term care insurance or a gifting program, you need to have a plan. And that plan has got to be done with an advisor, a professional advisor, who is familiar with the Medicaid regulations. Today's options include things like entering into a contract with a family member who is living with you or near you to provide care or renting a space from your heirs in order to get money to your family. You can gift and get back promissory notes from your children. You can purchase immediate annuities. However, annuities that will qualify for Medicaid eligibility have to be compliant with Medicaid regulations. You need to get advice before you purchase annuities, especially immediate annuities. You can make multiple gifts and the kids can give back part if that's needed in order to get you uh, outside the five-year period. Now, how do you protect yourself and your family? I mean, all this sounds pretty dark and gloomy. Well, it's the law. And my job is not to tell you how the law ought to be. It's how it is. So the first thing you need to do is to seek out and question, ask questions about Medicaid. Secondly, have your estate planning documents in place. Ladies and gentlemen, any of us could become incapacitated, unable to function mentally or physically today on the way home from this presentation. If that happens, who takes over your affairs, financial, your medical affairs? Who is in charge? When you pass away, who's in charge? The bottom line is that you need to have estate planning documents in place. And the first document is a will, a last will and testament. Every time I, I, I discuss this subject, I remember I actually had a will come into my office when a person passed away. I didn't draft this will. I think I'm proud to say that. <clears throat> and the last paragraph of the will said, after you've taken care of everything else, I want all of my creditors, the people I owe money to, to be my pallbearers. <laughs> They've carried me this far. They might as well finish the job. You know, there's somebody who checked out of this world with a sense of humor. Everybody over the age of 18 should have a will. Why? Because if you don't have a will, the state of Ohio has an estate plan for you, and it may not be what you would have wanted. Do you need a revocable living trust? Not everyone does. Living trusts accomplish a great many things for people. They can avoid probate. They can protect a portion of the estate. If you pass away and your spouse remarries, they can impose discipline on children so that they don't spend all of their inheritance at one time. But not everyone needs a revocable trust. You need to know the cost and you need to know the benefit. Third, someone somewhere should have a financial... Let me say that again. Someone trustworthy should have a financial power of attorney for you that says, if I become incapacitated tomorrow, here's the person that takes over and can sign my name and handle my financial affairs and pay my bills. What else? A health care power of attorney. If you are incapacitated, who has the ability to make health care decisions for you? If you don't have one of these in place, Healthcare decisions may not be capable of being made. It may end up in the probate court with a guardian being appointed for you. A power of attorney for health care is a very critically important document for everyone to have to make sure that someone can speak for you if you can't speak for yourself. And by the way, tell somebody where those documents are, will you please? You're really good at hiding your stuff. We know that. But the fact of the matter is, if we can't find these documents, then they don't exist in the eyes of the law. There are companies to whom you can send your documents. They'll photocopy them. They'll put them, store them electronically. And they give you a card that says, if I'm unconscious and you need my health care documents, call the 800 number 24-7, and these documents will be faxed or emailed to you. But you need to look at these things. And then, of course, it doesn't take much to just talk about a living will if I simply mention the name of Terry Schiavo. Everybody, I think, remembers. Horribly tragic case, no hope of recovery, couldn't turn off the life support because there was nothing in writing. A living will is your own way of saying, I don't want that. 
if two doctors say that I am terminally ill or permanently unconscious, I want all measures to stop. If you don't have that in place, without action in the probate court, heroic measures may have to continue. So, first of all, ask questions. Secondly, have proper estate planning documents in place. And here's the part that I really can't emphasize enough. Please be careful who you take advice from. And I know there are tons of people out there offering advice. They're on television. They're on the internet. They're in the newspapers. Remember that every state's law is different. The county in which you live may be different. Get advice. And in this case, in my opinion, you really need to get the advice of a competent estate planning or elder law attorney. This is not the place for do-it-yourself. My daughter refers to me as Handyman Jack around the house, but this is not the place to be doing it yourself. You really need to get advice before you enter into this, and these are the people that you should contact. How do you know if an attorney is experienced in elder law or estate planning? Ask them. Ask them how many cases they've handled, how many people they've counseled about this. Now, a quick review of where we've come in the last 35 minutes. I hope now that everybody understands that everybody needs to have a plan. This is a part of life where we can't afford to go on without a plan. The big picture is that the government is increasingly unable to pay for our nursing home care, and that need, that inability, and our need for nursing home services, which seems to be increasing in cost all of the time, it means that your inheritance for your children and grandchildren could disappear. In general, we've gone over the rules for Medicaid. We talked about options and some new planning strategies. Remember, people don't plan to fail. They just forget or fail to plan. That is the cardinal problem. And this is the enemy, ladies and gentlemen. Don't let this happen. Get out of the hammock. Do something, but do it now. Do it now. It has been a pleasure to talk to you. I understand we have a traveling microphone for questions, so let's get to the questions. Besides that one. Yes, yes ma'am, and then I know there was a question over here. Wait for the microphone, please. <coughs> When's the earliest you should start um, looking at long-term health care policies? Good question. Uh, the question is, when should you start looking at obtaining long-term health care insurance? Uh, I'm not sure there is a time that's too early because, as I said, you can become disabled at any time because of an illness or an accident. Unfortunately, the older we get, the more it costs, and the less likely it is that we'll ever be able to get it. So my answer to that is now. I would sh certainly look at the cost of it now, keeping in mind that with long-term care insurance, most of the time the cost does not go up unless the insurance companies raise the rates on everyone within your age category. All right. Now, it's been estimated that the baby boomers, there's some of us in this room that still choose to think of ourselves that way, the baby boomers have yet to hit the nursing homes. So the cost of nursing home insurance may be going up. The time to get it, as far as I'm concerned, the time to at least look at it is now. Uh, I know there was a question over here. <clears throat> One moment, please. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One is the gifting you talked about, okay, and you talked about $300,000 gift. What about like if like a, a grandparent gives Christmas gifts of $25, $50 to their grandchildren, whatever? Does that all have to be kept in account? All right, so the first question is how much is enough of a gift to start making a difference for the five-year look-back rule? And the answer is they all count, but typically the ones that are most serious are the ones that get over $1,000. You need to remember something. If you make a series of gifts, if you notice my example was we made one gift of three, I, I picked a number, it could have been less, could have been more, $300,000. If you make a series of gifts, they all count, they all add up, and the five-year look-back period begins to run on the date of the last gift. So one significant gift is better than a series of gifts. Next question. Okay, the other question was, could you comment more on the um, 
when you talked about the contract with a caregiver, uh, you know, how that goes, how you do that or whatever, yeah. what sure. you meant by that? Contract with a caregiver, uh, first of all, please understand that I'm going to make very general statements here because time does not permit otherwise. In general, you can enter into a contract with a family member in writing that will say, I need care, you're going to provide it, I'm going to pay you this much. The pay scale has to be comparable to what an outsider would charge in order to be reasonable. But I know that there are many times when family members come in long after a person has become disabled and said, you know, I rendered all these services, I'm entitled to be paid before Medicaid gets paid. That won't work. There has to be a contract in writing. It has to be reasonable. All right? Another question. Back here first and then over here. Isn't it true that long-term care insurance isn't in perpetuity, that there are limitations on how long a period they will carry? Cover? Good question. Good question. Uh, is long-term care insurance forever, or is it for a specific period of time? I have actually seen old contracts that are supposed to last for a lifetime, but that is not the case today. When you purchase long-term care insurance, you are buying a pot of money. The more you pay, the, the bigger the pot, and vice versa. Typically, you will buy a long-term care product that will promise a, a, a daily maximum benefit, such as $150 a day, or a maximum lifetime benefit, no matter how long it takes to use it up. Most contracts that I see today are in the area of two to five years. For the reasons I've outlined here today, in my opinion, the minimum benefit period you should be looking at is five years. Another question over here? Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, isn't it true that having a will or trust doesn't uh, avoid probate? It only makes the process faster? question is, having a will or a trust, does it avoid probate or does it make the process faster? If a person has a revocable living trust and the assets they own are transferred into that trust during their lifetime, there is no probate on those assets. None. If they leave assets outside of the trust, that's typically handled by something called a pour over will. That has to go through probate, but eventually it ends up inside the living trust. Yes, ma'am. One, one second, please. Thank you. I am a baby boomer, and I have been researching long-term care. And one of the things that disturbed me was it said, you can buy long-term care, but the insurer can, you know, up the premium at any time. And if you cannot afford to pay that premium, all is lost. So, you know, just from what I read, basically, that's what I understood. So I was wondering if that's the case, then what else is available for us? Is there, are there any other avenues? Uh, I think you all heard the question, but let me just repeat it very quickly. There are, this lady's concern is that if the insurer can up the premiums at any time during the period of your coverage, it's possible you won't have long-term care because you can no longer afford it. It's a good point. The devil is in the details. Look at the policies carefully. As I said before, they typically, in, in, in most insurance companies, they will not raise the premium unless they raise it for everyone within your age category. Now, one of the other ways to do that, if you're going to go the long-term care route, is to plan to set aside and dedicate another portion of your assets to being able to pay the increased premium if that occurs. I mean, it's easy to talk about this. It's another thing to be able to afford to pay it. Some people will turn to reverse mortgages to pay for the long-term care insurance or to pay, to the, pay for the increase in their long-term care insurance should that occur. Okay? I'm sorry to say there is no perfect solution. You got a question, sir? So are you saying that the Medicaid program is probably a last resort then that we might want to uh, try to get on to? Because it doesn't sound like it's going to be beneficial down the road. The question is, is Medicaid a last resort because it doesn't sound, or at least I'm making it sound like it's not going to be too beneficial down the road. <coughs> Medicaid is the safety net. 
Medicaid is the last resort. It's for people who have essentially run out of money. The problem is that there are an increasing number of people running out of money, and the state is, is bearing the burden of all this. That's why it becomes tougher and tougher to qualify for Medicaid. So in a sense, we, we should all look at Medicaid as the last resort. If we've run out of money, if we've exhausted every avenue that we have, Medicaid is our safety net. If people continue to think that my safety net is my children, my children will take care of me. Please, think about that. First, children are scattered far and wide. They physically can't get there to take care of parents. Secondly, children have their own lives, and many of them have two jobs just to make it in today's inflationary economy. Is it realistic to expect your children to take care of you? And perhaps most importantly, is it a healthy thing for your children to be expected to take care of you? I suggest you carefully consider that before choosing that option. Any other questions? Over here. Yes, I just wanted to ask you, um, do you think, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do you think as far as like sweetening the pot, so to speak, that with the advent of more and more people needing this long-term care insurance, just kind of like how insurance goes, uh, to sweeten the pot other than the death benefit, do you think they'll ever go back to a thing where, you know, things can establish cash value like the old time, you know, whole life insurance, and now we all, all it's almost all term now. But do you think that, you know, they'll see that there's such a need that to entice people to, uh, you know, kind of buy into that, that they would uh, be able also to maybe accumulate a cash value other than just the death benefit, because that kind of, kind of sounds like they were trying to sweeten the pot that way. Right. But the cash value thing is always a great enticement, I think, for people just for that reason that you said, mm -hmm. you know, you may be doing this, never even use it. You put all that money into that, and right. uh, it never has been used and never seen. It's an interesting question. Uh, what is my best prediction? This gentleman is asking that the insurance industry will respond to the increasing number of people that need long-term care insurance by coming up with sweeter products, products that, for example, will accumulate cash value. They're out there now. There are insurance products that can accumulate cash value, but what you need to remember is that that cash value is going to have to be spent if you own the policy and you're the one who needs nursing care. That's another countable resource. Another question. Up here and over there. Oh, I'm sorry. In reference to the financial planners and elder law attorneys, are there organizations that you recommend? Because it seems like there's so many organizations out there that offer certification, but would you have any recommendations of websites or organizations that you think are reputable? <sighs> or, <laughs> whew, could you please put me on the spot next time? <laughs> uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, I would, first of all, consult with NALA, N-A-E-L-A, -E and that is the National Association of elder law attorneys. There is a national website. I am not in that, but the lawyer who co-counsels with my law firm is. Um, that gives you a list of people who have met the qualifications to practice in the elder law area. You've raised a very good question about financial planners because there really uh, is no licensing process for people to call themselves elder law advisors. And be careful, because one of the solutions that I am seeing proposed more and more to solve the nursing home problem is purchasing immediate annuities. Many of them do not qualify for Medicaid. They won't work. So I would consult with an elder law attorney before I go to see that financial planner. Is that a fair answer to your question? Okay. Yes, over here. My first appointment is Monday morning at 7. I'm yours until then if the, if the film will, will last. Why do you think people procrastinate in planning for long-term care? Why do we all procrastinate? Uh, this interesting question. Uh, I think the answer is because most people find this an unpleasant topic and um, playing the part of the ostrich seems to be the best way. Uh, if your head is in the sand, you don't know, you don't care. Uh, procrastination is dangerous, ladies and gentlemen, in this area because many times when people become incapacitated, 
it's like that. It's a stroke. It's an accident. It's an illness. If you don't have your plan in place, it's too late to do it if you become incapacitated. So fight procrastination. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. The first one is um, my mother would not qualify. She's 81, wouldn't qualify for Medicaid. She um, does have a long-term care policy. Um, but my question is, on the, uh, does Medicare have similar rules to the look-back period as far as what um, of her assets a nursing home could take if her long-term care policy runs out? Oh, I see. So your question is, if your mother-in-law has, mother. sorry, your mother, mother, I'm sorry, is 81 and she has long-term care insurance, and you said Medicare, but I think you mean Medicaid, does Medicaid have regulations as to whether or not that person will qualify if they have long-term care insurance? No, she she won't qualify for Medicaid. Okay. Um, she ha she would go under Medicare. All right. And she has a long-term care policy. Right. If uh, what I've heard is is if she doesn't sell her house, or there's a there's a period of time where if she sells her house now, but in a year has to go into a nursing home care nursing home and doesn't can't af afford to pay, that they could go after the money. Of her, of her house. All right, so let me make sure I understand the question. If this person could not qualify for Medicaid because, for example, she owns a home, if she goes into a nursing home and all of her other assets are gone, we've spent them, will Medicaid require that house to be sold? Sure. It's a countable resource. It has to be sold, the proceeds used to pay for the nursing home before Medicaid will allow her to qualify. They may put her on Medicaid if you can show a good faith effort to sell that home, you're trying to sell it, and heavens knows in today's economy that's a challenge, but as soon as it is sold, she's off Medicaid, the proceeds have to be spent, and then she could get back on. Second question? I forgot. Okay. <laughs> One of my clients said, I don't have any questions until 20 minutes after I get out of here. Are there any other questions? Well, you have been terrific. I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you, and please, please, please plan now. Thank you.